Coast Journal Preview. This is a show where we take a look at what's coming to the current edition of the North Coast Journal. I am your host, Tanya Shrum, and we are joined by North Coast Journal's news editor, Thad Greenson, and Arts and Features editor, Jennifer Fumiko Cahill. How are you doing? Being here. How's everybody doing? Doing well. Braced for the frigid storm that's supposed to hit us any day now. Yes, everybody needs to batten down the hatches and just a real quick bit of housekeeping. Make sure to mail in your ballots this week if you're not voting in person. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, I think you have something to mention real quick before we get to the news. Oh, do I? Do I, though? I do. Because um, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at the North Coast Journal site because it didn't make it into the paper due to space, tragically. But um, someone we know, Fad Greenson, uh, won a very prestigious award this week. Um, He's, you know, I mean, I get it. It's not that big a deal. He's always winning awards. But this one's pretty cool. It is from the First Amendment Coalition, and they have an annual free speech and open government award. And Thad was chosen for his, um, let me see, this this award, by the way, is for outstanding contributions to the advancement of free expression or the people's right to know about their government, which is kind of Thad's specialty because there's nothing he likes more than a FOIA request. And he certainly made a lot of them for this story. The South Files was singled out as a winner. And just to give you, if you haven't read that story already, it's a, it's really fantastic. And that started with one tip and then followed it all the way through to um, internal police documents, interviews, all kinds of evidence, videos, things that he had to fight to get and that our lawyer had to fight to get. And um, it took a long time, and he worked on this story alone from our tiny newsroom and found himself among the other award winners, including uh, the New York Times, Bloomberg, and Muck Rock. Uh, those are the other recipients of the award. So um, they find themselves in the excellent company of Thad now. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, and congratulations, Thad on this prestigious award, our superhero of the fourth estate. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Jen. It's pretty cool. And with that, uh, Mr. Greenson, would you like to let us know what is coming to this week's North Coast Journal? Yeah, so this week's uh, cover story is following up on the reporting I did on uh, on Stephen Dinsmore and um, regular listeners, readers, viewers will recall he is the uh, the gentleman from Eureka who was serving a 30 year, 30 plus year prison sentence um, for assault uh, on a peace officer with a firearm um, who had petitioned the Humboldt County Superior Court uh, to release him early. Um, and uh, a judge did that. And then um, the Humboldt County District Attorney's Office appealed and uh, the appellate court ultimately ruled that the judge had kind of abused his discretion and violated the law by releasing him. And there was a whole bunch of months long back and forth of Steve sitting in the Humboldt County Jail and was kind of lawyers fought over what to do with him and whether he could be released um, until a new law took effect, AB 600 on January 1st. And then John Feeney um, followed through with his original intent, now with the backing of the law behind him and uh, and resentenced Stephen, ordered him released. And now he is uh, he's back a free man and working for Caltrans. Um, so for this story, I'd kind of already reported on all that, but I really wanted to dive into um, kind of the origins of this law, AB 600. And um, it really it was uh, the first draft of it was written by um, by Steve's appellate attorney. And so I had um, had the opportunity to catch up with him, uh, Richard Brauker, who um, works for the uh, first um, first district appellate project. And um, I just kind of became captivated by by Richard and, and his story of kind of his view of the law and then why he took such a special interest in Steve's case. And 
one of the things that kind of immediately jumped out at me is, you know, the Humboldt County Public Defender's Office reached out to Richard um, when the DA appealed Steve's release because um, they don't handle appeals um, and asking him if he'd take on the case. And so one of the first things he did was kind of read through the transcript of the hearing in which uh, Judge Feeney had ordered ordered Steve released. And he said, you know, two things kind of immediately jumped out at him. One is that, like, releasing Steve was the right thing and that he, you know, kind of come with um, – not just to argue that he'd been rehabilitated while in, in prison, but um, kind of with the receipts, with a whole trove of, you know, letters of commendation and, and certificates from various programs and stuff. Um, so he said, you know, like he was struck by that Feeney absolutely did the right thing and that he was absolutely like outside the law. Um, and so he was like, I just kind of knew I needed to take on this case and I knew that I was going to lose. Um, and um, so that was kind of inherently captivating. And then he talked about how, because he knew that they were going to lose this appeal, um, that he started looking at other avenues to, to kind of um, really reverse engineer um, Judge Feeney's ruling to make it legal. And so he figured out kind of a way to do that and um, pitched to some people that are part of a movement, uh, as he termed it, um, to um, reframe California sentencing law um, and really focus on ameliorative, ameliorative sentencing. And uh, and then so took this kind of draft language to them and they brought it to assembly member Phil Ting, who um, has been kind of a champion of, of uh, sentencing reform in the state. And he got it passed and signed into law. And um, now not only is, you know, is, is Stephen a free man because of this law, but um, it really opens up a, a, a whole new avenue for um, state prison inmates to petition for resentencing, um, re giving judges, um, you know, really the, the discretion for the first time to recall and resentence cases that they, they feel are appropriate. Um, which previously, you know, was a power that uh, district attorneys had, the state secretary of prisons had, but judges did not. Um, and uh, and Richard, you know, really saw that as an imbalance in the law. And I really appreciated uh, Representative Ting's like thought process about how laws should be something that you go back and look at as times mm -hmm. change and as people change. Yeah, I, I loved his quote to me of you know saying like yeah we always like hold you know hindsight being twenty twenty is this like elevated thing so why not just apply that to sentencing why not allow judges to say yeah this sentence I handed down twenty years ago like maybe let's look at that again and let's look at that in the context of you know present day laws present day perspectives and also in the context of you know what work uh, somebody may or may not have done while they were in custody um maybe they're a different person now than they were 20 years ago and, and that should absolutely be taken into account well thank you Thur uh, thad and do you have any final thoughts on this story before we move on to the next news segment you know, I think the the only thing I'd add is, you know, Richard uh, Richard's quote to me um, about kind of what he views the law as I thought was just really interesting. Um, you know, he was kind of saying that it's not it's not politics, it's not people, it's not history, it's it's the culture, it's all of those things. And I think um, I just thought that was a really interesting way to view the law as um, you know as something that that is and kind of inherently should be fluid um, and reflective of of the culture of of us. And so I thought that was neat. But I encourage folks to, to read the full story. Yes, and I encourage everybody to pick up this week's North Coast Journal and read all of Thad's material. <laughs> and speaking of which, what is the next story do you, you have for us this week? Yeah, I'll just touch on the next story really quickly. It's following up on um, on reporting from a couple weeks ago that we did on the uh, commission, the California Commission on Judicial Performance, um, filing what's called a, a notice of proceedings, essentially filing um, ethics charges against uh, Greg Kreis, uh, the, actually the, the presiding judge in Humboldt uh, Superior Court currently, who is uh, up for re-election um, next week. And uh, that uh, that filing was a, a bombshell that alleged um, 19 counts of misconduct, everything kind of from kind of failing to disclose um, personal relationships with litigants in his courtroom and recuse himself from cases involving them to um, some illegal activity, including including drug use, drinking while driving. Um, uh, sexual harassment or assault, um, very, very serious allegations. Um, and so we followed up this week, he filed his official response to those, um, his official answer, and um, essentially denied all of the most serious allegations. Um, there was uh, some allegations of, of discourtesy that he kind of um, 
you know, said that he was attempting to bring levity in the courtroom and wasn't and what didn't intend to, you know, offend anybody. Um, but so he admitted a few of the minor things, but really on all the major um, issues, he kind of issued a full throated a full throated denial. So unfortunately, you know, the primary is right around the corner. We're not going to get any clarity on um, on this um, before then. Um, this is now going to head to a, a, a formal proceeding. Um, uh, presided over by three ma uh, special magistrates uh, assigned by the Supreme Court, and then they will issue a report, which then the Commission on Judicial Performance will decide what to do with everything from, you know, kind of clearing uh, Judge Christ of all the charges to, um, you know, publicly censuring or reprimanding him or, in most extreme, uh, removing him from from office if he is, if he wins re-election is and still in office when this happens. Well, and we very much appreciate that report. And even though it still uh, seems to be, you know, up in the air about how this will affect the election, but we appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to the follow up after the hearing. Yeah, absolutely. And shifting gears to something in all of our backyards is the final news story this week. Yeah, a rare bit of good news that I got to write about. Um, I, I dove in this week to uh, the uh, McKinleyville Community Services District's plans for the new uh, McKinleyville Community Forest, um, which they just closed ownership on, um, I think, at the very end of January um, and announced it earlier this month. And um, this is a uh, former Green Diamond Resource Company property, uh, about 600 acres just to the east of McKinleyville. So it's on the eastern edge of McKinleyville from Murray, uh, Murray Road down to, I think it's Hunt Drive. Um, and uh, so it's a little swath of property kind of adjacent to Green Diamond's holdings, which it will continue to have that separate kind of McKinleyville from Fieldbrook. Um, but uh, so a lot of excitement. I mean, these I don't know um, how long you've been up here, Tanya, but this has um, been talked about since I moved to Humboldt County in 2002. I think it predates that by about 10 years or so. Um, but um, it has been kind of over the last decade, really kind of gaining some steam as, um, through a partnership with the with, um, with a nonprofit that kind of helps um, helps find funds for community forests and whatnot. And um, so the fish, the purchase is finally um, complete. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, now we can go hiking and biking and horseback riding in the community forest. And unfortunately, not quite so fast. You can do those things, but it is very much like a, you know, kind of defunct timberland with uh, some kind of, you know, overgrown trails and uh, rabbit trails and those kinds of things. Um, and really, this is kind of the very beginning now of what's going to be a really, really long process to get this thing resembling anything like what uh, the Arcadia Community Forest is. Um, so, but if folks are, you know, are gung-ho, they can go explore the property, um, urge to kind of do so at their own risk. Um, and probably more importantly at this point, the, the, McKinley, the McKinleyville Community Services District is moving forward with putting together a community forest committee. Um, so if folks are interested, they can reach out to the, to the district to uh, see about serving on that committee. Or if, the, you know, they can't make that commitment, they can at least um, start attending those committee meetings, providing input on what they'd like to see in a community forest. And then also the district is likely to plan some um, some volunteer work days coming up soon to uh, do things like starting to clear those trails and clean up trash and debris and stuff. So folks can be on the lookout for that and, and help out. And I also appreciated that there was the call to action of if you see anything, say anything now that this property is kind of becoming part of the community officially. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you brought that up. The Green Diamond has traditionally had security, you know, details that kind of patrol the property and, you know, make sure um, any encampments or anything like that aren't aren't getting out of hand or there's no illegal activity going on. And and obviously with the transfer of ownership, those go away. There's going to be some parks, um, parks and recreation uh, employees from the district who periodically walk it, but they're really relying on the public's help to kind of be eyes and ears. And like you said, if you, if you see something, say something. So um, if you are using the property and notice anything out of sorts, uh, notify the district. And it is always been kind of an area that everybody on the hush hush would utilize. Um, mm -hmm. I would say the only thing that I've ever discovered on that property is you will get ticks. So make sure to check yourself when you get home because <laughs> it is. That's, that's a pro tip. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Thad. And uh, do you have any final thoughts on this before we shift over to the arts and features beat? No, just as an exciting development, and we'll keep reporting on it as it as it takes shape. All right, I know you will. And with that, we're going to switch to some very exciting news on the arts and features beat with Jennifer. And she has got my number this week. That's right. What is full of Mexican and Indian food besides me? Mm. In fact, the Taqueria Martinez truck in McKinleyville, at least on Wednesdays and Thursdays anyway. So I have a very, to me, exciting story about um, something that kind of happens all the time. So particularly among immigrant families, but I think among lots and lots of families, it's, you know, immigrant families are the ones I know. So, um, you know, we trade food, especially when there are other barriers like language barriers, maybe like we have different jobs, we have different, we trade food. Um, and it's a way of, you know, as they say, breaking bread, you know, bonding, et cetera, but also communicating your culture, the things that are different and the things that you have in common. And um, in fact, when you think about it, Indian and Mexican do have a lot in common in that they are very bean and flatbread forward and they do a lot with spice profile, right? Two wildly different flavors or flavor profiles, flavor families coming out of some overlapping ingredients, which is very interesting to me. And this week, the story is about the, as I said, the Tuckeria Martinez truck, which is really trying to become my favorite food truck, really pushing all my buttons between the effort they did to help feed people with uh, World Kitchen in Rio Dell after the quake, and the fact that they make maybe the thickest quesadilla tacos in Humboldt. And the soup that you get on the side, the consomme, has like a whole other tacos worth of meat in it. Yeah, they're, they're really winning me over. But <laughs> they are also hosting an Indian pop-up. And that came about because the gas station on the corner near, you know, the Samoa Bridge when you're leaving Eureka, so that gas station is where the Tuckeria Martinez original truck started parking four years ago. Um, when first I had their Aztec, Aztec style um, asada burrito. And that gas station has a cashier so um, who became friends with the owner of the truck. Miguel Santiago Martinez is the owner of the truck. And he and Harjit Mali, struck up a friendship being in that same location, right? And of course, as you get to know people, et cetera, that usually means food gets involved. And Harjit, who I'm sure has sampled more than his share of the truck's wares, um, also brought some food from home that his wife made. And his wife, uh, Jaswinder Karmali, is a fantastic cook. Um, she is home taught and partly self-taught, but the whole family hails from the Punjab region of India. And, um, you know, it's got its own style of cooking. Um, you know, we tend to think in the US about Indian food and Mexican food as being a monolith, but in fact, they are large countries, especially, my God, India. And they have all sorts of different landscapes and, um, you know, climates within them, which means all different styles of food, different, um, yeah, different takes on sometimes really dissimilar dishes even. Um, so anyway, her particular kind of cooking is a vegetarian Punjabi style Indian. Her, She and her family are Sikh, and she's done a lot of cooking for um, the get togethers that the Sikh families have at the Sikh temple in Humboldt. And sometimes that can mean cooking for like 50 people or more. Um, she's cooked for parties and weddings and things that mean cooking for 100 people. Um, and it's pretty fantastic. So is she's Indian ready. The, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> is Indian the only cuisine that I trust with a piece of cauliflower? Maybe, maybe. Um, <laughs> But it's it's fantastic. And so they got together and about a month ago they started talking about like, you know, how 
it had been, you know, Jaswinder's dream to kind of have a restaurant or a food truck or something. And they thought, well, why don't we try doing a pop-up in the truck and see what the response is like, see if there's a demand for this food. And I must tell you that in Humboldt County, that we only have one Indian restaurant. What's up, Tendori Bites? Um, that's crazy. We need more. So, especially someplace that specializes in vegetarian. Um, so they started doing this just last week and they're going to have the pop-up in the McKinleyville um, truck, the uh, Martinez truck, on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And it's pretty great. You should check Facebook, maybe call ahead to the truck to make sure that everything is still on, because as you know, things with food trucks can be fluid. They move around, spaces work or don't work. But, but it's the worst really... case scenario, you have to give fine Mexican food instead. Yes, boo-hoo, <laughs> right? <laughs> But it's it's pretty great, and I'm I really was um, struck by honestly how how good the food is. Um, there is something about, and it was lovely. By the way, I have to say thank you to Tanvir and Gigi, uh, relatives of Jaswinder, who helped uh, translate for us. Um, there's something really, um, I think, luxurious about Indian vegetarian food. It is conceived of as it is, as opposed to a cuisine where the meat has been removed. And it is so deeply satisfying. The potato stuffed parantha, alu parantha was just this wonderful, very rich bread covered in butter. And, you know, likewise, the lovely bubbly soft, fried bread that you kind of pick up the chickpeas, the stewed chickpeas with is just delightful. Um, is there a better way of eating than tearing a piece of bread and using it to scoop up something stewed and wonderful? I mean, it's pretty good, right? You're not going to hear any argument here. I, I'm very pro chopstick, but eating food with other food as your utensil is pretty good. Um, so it's lovely to be to get a chance to do that on the street, you know, like getting your takeout, sitting in your car as I do alone, eating Indian food. <laughs> and anyway, so it's a very cool thing. And I'm really interested to see um, how Humboldt responds and uh, whether, you know, we can get our work our way to having an Indian food truck. Let's do oh. it. Let's do it, Humble. Yeah. Get up there to McKinleyville and show some love. Yes. And then we also just uh, here briefly have a wonderful article by Sarah Hobart. Yes. That was very exciting. Yes. Our birder, Sarah Hobart, is excited about this bird renaming thing. I don't know if you've heard about it, but evidently some of the statues and other things that we have around the country are of people who are not great in retrospect. And so I think, you know, and I've heard people say like, we should only ever build statues of animals from now on and I'm for it. But the naming of some birds is another thing that we've found to be uh, kind of, you know, not as inclusive as it could be. And the American Ornithological Society has decided to rename birds about a half a dozen per year and, and taking away the people's names that are attached to them. Because even like I did not know this until I read Sarah's article, John James Audubon of the Audubon Society was not only a slave owner, but an anti-abolitionist. So it's not enough just to own the slaves. You have to be anti-abolitionist. That's pretty, wow, just extra, just a little extra. Um, like what did he have, bumper stickers on his buggy? My God. So anyway, um, there are lots of people that are, you know, sort of neutral or whatever, but some of them, like one of the people who she points out that they're taking his name off of a bird, um, shot the first specimen that he saw. So uh, it doesn't feel right for her as a birder. I want everybody to read it, and especially because <laughs> you can get involved in yeah. naming because they are going to take uh, input from the public. So yeah. pick up this copy, this week's copy of the North Coast Journal and get involved if you're a birder. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm so sorry. I, I thought we'd have a few more minutes there, but that wraps up our time for this week. 
the current edition of the North Coast Journal is available on newsstands now. Pick up your copy or find it digitally at northcoastjournal.com. I am Tanya Shrum. Thanks for being with us, staying informed and supportive of our North Coast community. Thank you.